Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back. We are finally doing it. I know, it's a miracle, right? We're building the ES-335 kit from Solo Music Gear. I've been sitting on this build way too long at this point. Lots of stuff has come up. Sorry for the delay, but finally, we're getting into it. First things first, if you are looking for one of these, if you want to build along, if you want to have one of these, it's a beautiful kit available at solomusicgear.com or sologuitars.com and uh, my link is in the description so if you pick one up through there helps me out it's an affiliate link i appreciate it anyway we've already done a couple things on this first of all i've done a couple tool comparison videos um, from last year they were crimson guitars tools stumac all that stuff so we compared a few fret crowning tools we compared a few fret end dressing tools even some fret leveling beams i think um, so all of that fret work is done. These frets are nicely leveled, polished, looking good. Also, obviously, next glued in. And now we get to move on. You might be thinking, move on to what? Well, with this guy, I mean, it's, with some kits, we do a mock-up first. Um, these are a pain. They're a pain in the butt to get ready to go, to get um, installed, all the electronics and all that. It's, yeah, it, I'm not doing a mock-up. I'm just going to do the build. Um, so first things first, we're going to do our finishing work before we do, we're not doing an actual mock-up, but we do need to make sure that everything fits. So, and it's not going to, because I'm not installing the stock parts. It's all going to be very similar, but what I'm installing here is a volume bleed set, a wiring harness from gun street wiring. You guys have seen me use their stuff before. It's awesome stuff. Um, but what, <laughs> What I'm faced with when I use this is an issue where nothing ever fits in these stock kits because all the shafts on these pots are bigger and stuff. They're, they're just higher quality than, than what comes with the kit. It, you know, it can't be avoided. Um, so if you're going to go with something like this, you need to make sure that it's going to fit. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to take it off of here and just test them out, uh, see how far off we are, and then drill out. We'll get them installed. So I'll show you guys how I do that. It's a pretty straightforward process. You can use, when the guitar is unfinished, pretty much any bit of the appropriate size. I like to use step bits. Um, they center nicely. They're very, very simple to use. And I actually like to use step bits as well if I have to drill into a finish for something like this. But the, way, the real way to do this is what I'm doing right now. Avoid, avoid putting the finish on and test this out first. So let's... Let's see what does and does not fit here. First of all, the switch should fit. And it does. It's snug, but it fits. Can I get it back out? Okay. So the switch fits. It's just going to be a bit tight. And that is fine. I have no qualms with that. Now, this is all very, very well put together, <laughs> this wiring harness. So I'm trying to avoid messing any of it up because it's literally, look at it. It's beautiful. Um, Output jack fits, no problem. So we're left with the obvious, the pots, and they do not fit. No surprise there. I'm gonna get a stepper bit. I'm gonna check how, how big I think I need to go here, and then I'm gonna get these drilled out. Yep, 3 eighths is the next step up, so let's do that. Piece of cake. So I've done that now before I even sand this. So any, well, there's not really much going on there, but any imperfections will be sanded out as part of the next part of the process. And then we'll paint. Pretty straightforward, right? Testing, testing. Oh yeah. We're good. So now that we know that the holes are appropriate, we're all geared up for the electronics and everything. I'm just gonna check my bridge posts, but they should be fairly standard. And then we're good to go. Move on to the finish. You can pre-drill for your pickup rings. Not mandatory, but you can. Um, and you can also pre-drill for your trapeze uh, tail stop setup. So I might do that, um, and I might not. Haven't decided yet. Next stop on our video, though, is gonna be the shop. We're gonna prep sand this, get the fretboard taped off, and get going. So, let's get after it. 
All right, we've got the holes ready to go. Everything's glued up. What is this? I'm kind of jammed into a weird spot in the shop right now. I haven't been in here in a while because the day job has been keeping me very, very busy. So I've been working a lot of weekends and stuff. It's been tough to get in here. Now that I finally am, uh, it is a disaster in here. So I'm jammed into a weird spot. I'm gonna fire up the compressor here because I'm gonna sand this with the orbital sander and then I'm gonna paint it. Um, for the sealer, I'm probably just gonna use a spray can, Oxford sanding sealer. I do have it in a quart. Um, but for today's purposes, because today I'm just doing the sealer, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this option. So we'll go through the prep sanding. I will do it by voiceover. I'll fire the sealer on there. And then in the next video, so that's, sealer's this one. In the, that's this is extremely irritating. In, in the next video, I'm going to do, now there's dust falling from it. All right, third time's the charm. In the next video, <laughs> It's not actually gonna be titled this part of this series, so keep an eye out for it. It's gonna be a burst finish with nitrocellulose lacquer video. And we're gonna use Oxford Nitro. I've got my little tins here. We've got vintage amber, red mahogany, and tobacco brown. So we're gonna do a tutorial on bursts. I know a lot of people have wanted one. We're gonna use a small gun to do it, and it's gonna be really cool. I'm really looking forward to it, so stay tuned for that. Um, we're definitely going to burst the front. We're probably going to burst the back as well. And we'll do that whole deal. So today we're going to do the tape work and the sealer. I'm going to seal over the binding on this guitar. And then uh, I'll, I will be taping the binding for the purpose of doing the burst. But that'll be in the next one. I, I mean... If I continue talking at this point, I'll just be saying the same thing over and over again. So let's get to it. I'm gonna fire up the sander. I'll talk you through what I'm doing. We'll get some sealer on this guy and then stay tuned for the next episode. Let's get after it. I'm very excited to finally get some progress made on this guitar. I'm gonna be doing this with an orbital. Like I said, uh, if you're not accustomed to using an orbital sander, if you haven't done like, you know, a few hundred hours of sanding with one, uh, you should probably be sanding by hand, particularly on a surface like this because it's curved. A couple things here to note. One, if you are someone who's wildly observant, yes, that is my normal DynaBraid sander that you see me using for my finish sanding, for polishing and all of that. I've just replaced the pad on it with a five inch pad instead for a couple reasons. Um, I still have the six inch and I still use that for my finish sanding, but I've done this for, for two reasons. One, for this particular surface, I wanted the smaller diameter because I'm using it to sand in the rounds and curves a little bit. Um, and by that I mean the curves on the surface because it's a carved top. And two, availability of sandpaper. This is a 5 inch pad so I can get 5 uh, inch pads for it, sanding pads, uh, that are you know a little cheaper, a little easier to find. And then I use the 6 inch pad for the bulk of my polished sanding. So you can switch these back and forth. If anybody's interested in this kind of stuff, it's sitting in the Amazon link in my description, uh, the description of the video, and this is under the polishing tools, I think, or the woodworking tools, or something like that. I don't know. I put it in there ages ago. Again, you can do all of this by hand, and in fact, doing so with your palm is probably the safest option or a flexible sanding block for most of this. But if you've spent a lot of time with an orbital sander, there's nothing wrong with using it for this. You just have to be confident that you know what you're doing because you can screw it up a lot faster. It's also important to keep your sandpaper clean or keep changing it. Um, when you're sanding, particularly if you're sanding a finish, it can pill up and that paint buildup that you get on the sandpaper will cause scratching that you will see in your finish. So important to keep it clean. That's what I'm doing here. I'm using 400, no, sorry, 320 grit for this particular uh, job because I'm going to go over it with sealer. I did do a video recently discussing uh, prepping for paint and I talked about what sandpaper I would use. So I'm using 320 grit and one thing I need to note here is this kit comes with a coat of poly sealer on it. Just one coat. So it's certainly not fully sealed and I do need to go in with my sanding sealer. Um, but there is something on there just to keep it safe for shipping and everything and seal the wood up to some degree. So that's why you're seeing all this white dust instead of typical sanding dust. And that's part of why I need to keep my sandpaper kind of blown out. That's less of an issue when you're using like a 220 grit paper on raw wood. So we're working with poly here. This so far has all been at real time speed. I'm 
I've got my sander on kind of slow mode right now. I'm not I'm not doing anything too crazy. I'm not trying to take any wood away. I'm just trying to get this thing smoothed out nicely. So we're going to move to the back here and I'm going to kick this up to 300 times speed because there's no reason for you to watch me sand for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it happened to be. I'm carefully doing those edges first and I'm using the edges of my sander for it um, a little bit. But this is a dangerous game that I'm playing right now and you, you've got to be very careful if you're doing this. Uh, again, I'm working with the radius of the backing block to be able to sand this properly. But there's always a risk if you're doing this that you're going to dig in. Uh, kind of cut into your finish a little bit. It's not so bad with 320 grit, but if you're doing this on raw wood and you're working with 80 grit or 120, you're going to run a real risk of creating a sanding mark there. So be very careful if you're trying to do something like this. Again, sanding with your palm for that kind of area, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I recommend it, particularly if you don't do this a lot. Um, the neck, I never sand with a sander, obviously. It's very easy to just kind of wrap your hand around it or whatever and sand that way to get that curve followed. And in fact, if you are shaping a guitar neck, uh, that's the way to do it. Get the contour of your hand in there a little bit. It'll make it more comfortable to play. It doesn't always have to be the exact same C pattern, notwithstanding what some of the vintage guitar makers have told us. Now even if you have done this for long enough that your hand feels more comfortable with an orbital sander in it than without one, you're still going to want to do at least some work by hand, so you've got to get into kind of the really small areas by hand. The edge work is always easier either by hand or with some kind of flexible uh, sanding block, an eraser can work quite well for that but isn't really necessary. So I'm finishing this off by hand with some 320 grit and I'm actually giving the whole guitar kind of another swipe, even the areas that I've already done. This video is still at 300% speed, by the way. Um, but I'm doing that because I, I trust my palm to get into those edges and feel if anything is a little bit wacky. So I do that every time. And then, of course, these little areas that I need to get into, I can't do that with an orbital sander or really with a sanding block, for that matter. A little, like I said, an eraser, like something you would get for uh, children for school would work just fine. Uh, apparently I can't figure out what's in frame and what's out of frame when I film with this camera, but anyway, something like that would work just fine for those little areas. Um, but your hand really does work okay. You, what you want to avoid doing is pushing forward and back with your hand such that your fingers are kind of sliding forward or backward right along the surface because that can leave grooves. You'll see here that I'm moving my, my fingers sideways across the surface. That will not leave grooves because you're not actually imparting the shape of your finger on the on the surface through the sandpaper so be mindful of that you don't want to be doing a bunch of sanding with a, a really small area like one finger unless you are in a very small area otherwise you can mess it up so we're just finishing off here with the sanding and then it will be a simple matter of cleaning this thing with wax and grease remover uh, after I blow it off with the compressor uh, you can also vacuum it off and then we'll get moving on painting it. So it's got to be clean first. You don't want any dust trapped in the finish and then it uh, it's time to seal. As you all know I'm fortunate enough to have a, a booth here. Um, I've got a spot to hang this guitar in front of it which is nice and what I've done here I'm, I'm just wearing a glove on the hand that's actually going to be touching the guitar. I think I switched hands part way through this but anyway I've got a, a glove on that hand and I'm spraying with the other one. So this can be a bit tough on the arms I suppose uh, if you're you're not used to it having a hook screwed into the back like I do there right into the the bottom makes things a little easier and you can hang it and spray it while it's hanging if you have the right kind of facilities for that I don't really have a way to hang this at the correct height based on what's around me so I'm just doing it this way um, so what I'll do is I'll spray the bulk of the guitar holding it like this which isn't a problem and then I will just hang it up and spray the last little bit so that I don't have to hold the part that's got fresh paint on it and I'll finish up the headstock that way too. This is pretty straightforward. I'm, I'm anchoring the headstock against my hip to make sure that everything's nice and sturdy, nice and stable, although again not really a big deal and I'm just kind of painting in my usual way. This is real-time speed. If you guys have seen me uh, paint a lot you'll notice, uh, particularly if you're experienced painters, that I have a tendency to hold the can a little closer to the surface than many people would and just move a little quicker. That's my preference. It's certainly not a requirement. Uh, in many cases the recommendation is to hold the can a little further away, like six to eight inches, 
And in order to get a good coat doing that, you would have to spray a little bit slower. I, for some reason, put the guitar there backward uh, so that I was about to spray the entire neck facing away from the booth. That makes no sense. Aim your paint toward the booth. It's a pull booth in this case, but uh, if you guys have a fan or something like that, then you're going to want to do the opposite. Aim away from the fan with the flow of air so you're not blowing paint into the fan and having it come straight back at you. Uh, that would be funny, but foolish, so don't do that. As you can see, now that this is hung up, I'm just finishing it off, uh, doing the headstock, got it hanging there so I don't need to touch it, and we're good to go. That's coat one. One down, two to go. I clear the can out at the end, the nozzle, by spraying it upside down for a moment, and we'll come back in a moment. Through the not-so-magical magic of video editing, we are back, but in reality, I waited, I believe, about 10 or 15 minutes between coats. It's not, uh, it's not quite like spraying a polyurethane. The timing between coats is a little less critical, a little different, and a little bit more contingent upon the surrounding temperature and all of that. So it was quite warm while I was doing this. So I erred on the side of 10 minutes. If it were a little colder, I probably would have aimed for about 15. And if it were quite cold, which it never is in this shop, luckily, uh, I wouldn't be spraying at all because this is lacquer and lacquer is finicky when it comes to temperature. I have an old video on how temperature can affect your paint jobs. If you're, uh, if you're struggling with your paint doing things that you can't explain, like for example, not drying at all, it might be based on the temperature or humidity around it. So I'm doing the exact same thing here and I'm gonna do one more coat afterwards. So we'll speed this up in a moment. Uh, like I said, we're gonna be doing a really cool tutorial next where we're gonna do a burst finish. That's gonna be done in a similar situation uh, but using guns in three colors and it's all with Oxford Supply Paints. So if you haven't checked their stuff out, there is a link in the description, have a look, and if you do buy something through there, I would appreciate it if where it says, how did you find out about us, you put my name. It really helps me out, helps me keep working with these guys. Their stuff is also now available, at least most of it, through Solo Music Gear, and as you know, I have a link in the description to solomusicgear.com. You can check them out. There's tons of stuff there. They're expanding their selection all the time, uh, and I'm, of course, hoping to keep working with them as well. All right, so let's finish off this coat, and then we'll uh, give you a slightly different angle for the last one, camera angle, and we'll blast through that one at double time speed so that you don't have to watch me spray three coats in real time here. As always, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please feel free to give it a thumbs up. I would appreciate it, and remember to subscribe so you can see the rest of this kit. I know a lot of you have been really been looking forward to it, and it's taken me ages to get to it, so I'm really excited that we're finally doing that. I appreciate you guys checking out this series. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comment section below. And of course, as always, help each other out if you know the answers. Uh, and if you just want to go down there and chirp me about how long it's taken me to get to this, so be it. I deserve it. Thanks again for watching, guys. Stay tuned for the rest of the series, and I will see you next time. Have a good one.